It's funny because all men are idiots and need to go back to school. So last time I looked at a book that was silly and light-hearted and, but still had a lot of heart and charm. This is how not to do that. The School for Husbands by Wendy Holden is a ridiculous piece of chick lit about a failing marriage buckling under the pressure of financial insecurity and a new baby. Things come to a head when Sophie asks her husband Mark for a divorce and sods off with their son Arthur to live with her parents. Mark, instead of accepting this, enrolls in the School for Husbands to win her back. It is very silly and not to be taken seriously, which is actually more difficult than you might think. So the author can actually write, um, and she does use some nice turns of phrase. She also can be funny, and I genuinely found a few of the names and villages and things like that scattered throughout very amusing. I thought that the breakdown of the marriage was done well and attempted nuance by showing both sides so as not to completely vilify Mark, which would have been a very easy thing to do. Um, and I also appreciate that the main character, Sophie, um, isn't some stunning supermodel, but a real person with a body that reflects someone who has given birth. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's all I could think of. This is a list of things I thought of in no particular order, so it might go a bit everywhere. Also, there's probably going to be spoilers because I didn't really care to do a separate section, so... Yeah. Firstly, uh, I found Sophie pretty irritating. She was very oblivious and didn't have any backbone, which aren't necessarily bad traits to give your main character, but in this instance it just made her look really stupid. Mark missing his son Arthur whilst at the school was unbelievable because we never saw them bond in the first half. In fact, it was made clear that Mark mostly left Arthur to Sophie, um, so perhaps the focus had been more on regretting not spending more time with him, it would have been alright, but in this it just didn't make any sense. Uh, there is this obsession with godparents, which seems really weird for people who don't go to church regularly. Like they must have two, a man and a woman, and preferably childless and with disposable time and or income to spend with a child, or on the child. Um, meanwhile, my siblings and I all have a different number of, of godparents. My sister has one that, you know, since her birthday got every year. My brother had two, I've got three, and only one of them gives a Christmas card to my mum and she always gets my name wrong, so... <laughs> the tone is confused, a lot of it reads like it's meant to be a joke, but the first part with the marriage failing is so serious that it's difficult not to take the rest of it seriously as well. Because of this, the school comes across as just really stupid and its lessons incredibly insulting, and the students cartoonishly idiotic. Like, one bloke thinks that the dishwasher loads and stacks itself. Ha <laughs> ha, how funny, because, you know, women do all the work. The school also reads like a scam, uh, with all these, like, hidden costs. It's very expensive anyway, um, but then they have to wear this uniform, a cheap t-shirt and a baseball cap, which they have to buy. And then there are these books in the rooms so that they can purchase, but if they get them grubby, they've got to replace them out of their own pocket, which wouldn't necessarily be a problem if they got to bring their own entertainment along and books to read, which they are not. Um, and at dinner there are these bottles of water that cost five pounds each, apparently blessed by the Archbishop of Canterbury or someone, um, to have marriage mending powers. And no other drinks are mentioned, so presumably they have to buy magic water every single day. Uh, Simon Sharp, who is this millionaire romantic rival, because of course it's a millionaire romantic rival, there always is, is cold and uncaring to an exaggeratedly stupid degree. He only cares about money and nothing else. The only thing he's ever fallen in love with is his bank account, and I'm pretty sure that's a legit thing he, like, thinks. Um, he only wants to steal Sophie because his new bosses, the Wintergreens, have a habit of firing unmarried workers. But why go through all the trouble to woo Sophie, who is married, by the way, and try to fast-track her divorce, which just takes a very long time, when his co-workers have just been marrying randos, like mermaid order brides and people who need a visa and all that stuff. There's also a stereotyping problem. The Wintergreens are these Americans who only like eat beans and are obsessed with marriage and have plastic wives and several children and wear cowboy boots or something. And, and the childless people at work are all grumpy and clearly jealous of Sophie, you know, because she's got a marriage and a baby. Um, and the uber 
PC teacher um, who's one of the godparents is an almost insulting stereotype of left-wing activists. And then there was these like phonetic accents that some characters have and I hate those so... That was very annoying. Mark seems to be the only person at the School for Husbands who wants to be there, but it's so expensive, so why did the others all fork out for it? Divorce is cheaper, um, the lady who runs it says, but divorce is a better alternative if your marriage is terrible and the man clearly doesn't care to change. Let the women find someone better, please. The school is also very, the woman is always right in its teachings, um, which can be problematic and reinforces the idea that marriage is a ball and chain for men and that sucks, I don't like that either. Mark and Sophie have financial difficulties and yet Sophie buys ready meals from M&S, which costs like three times more than the ones from Iceland. Just go there like the rest of us. Um, Arthur goes to a fancy nursery where the other mums are like actresses and, and authors and BBC presenters or don't need jobs. How did Sophie afford the fees for Arthur to go there? They're always able to just drop money on, on taxis and trains and the Eurostar and scams disguised as schools whenever needed without a problem. Maybe, maybe they could have solved more of their problems by just learning how to budget. Uh, also, yeah, okay, spoilers, um, the financial issues are not fixed at the end. Mark quits his job just before the job was about to get a lot easier and probably pay more because part of the problem was he was working too long and wasn't getting paid very much. But now that the, the, that problem has sort of just been solved, he's probably gonna get paid more and have less work because they're gonna hire more staff. He quits and yet at the end of the book, they're able to go on a second honeymoon in Sydney across the world. And yet it only seems like a few months have passed. So I don't know what's going on there. Romanticizing alcoholism and turning to booze when stressed isn't funny. It's actually a very unhealthy coping mechanism. Let's stop with that joke. Uh, this book is very shallow. Although Sophie is not some stunning model, she's still described as pretty. All the nasty characters feel quite unattractive, like the women in the office. And at the school, there is this whole day dedicated to the men looking good, like spray tans, teeth whitening, all that stuff. And the three cheersome comments to say to your wife are, you look great have you lost weight and I love your new hair, which is insulting and perpetuating the idea that women should be prized for their attractiveness and nothing else, and men for their ability to give women nice things and take them on nice holidays and bow down to their every beck and need, which is damaging. You know, women are more than just pretty, men are more than women's servants in a marriage. Uh, it feels very entitled as well. The women at the office are nasty for daring to suggest that Sophie shouldn't be jetting off early to pick up Arthur from nursery. And the woman who runs the nursery is mean for threatening to drop Arthur because Sophie is consistently late picking him up. Yes, I feel sympathy for her with her M&S ready meals, but it's not fair to expect everyone to just rearrange their lives around her. But no, that's not it. Clearly the women were just bitter about her relationship. Um, and finally, everyone is married at the end because heaven forbid someone be single and happy. I suppose it is fun, but a little bit too stupid for such a serious and widespread problem. I guess if you can turn off your brain for the right parts, you might be able to just read it as something silly and non-serious. But it is handled a bit too seriously um, and sincerely. Like the author is holding some resentment towards men and childless and unmarried people, which isn't pleasant to really to read. So yeah, I, I don't think I'd recommend it to anyone. And um, that's all my thoughts on this book. I'll see you next time. Ciao.